This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 321. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, drinking One Nation coffee out of my Ice Planet Hoth coffee. There's really not a lot of nice weather on Hoth. There's not a lot of nice weather in Illinois these days either. But if you want to escape the weather and get to a warmer place, maybe, I don't know, the Disney theme parks like Disneyland or Walt Disney World, be sure to go to MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. They are the place to go. They can help you with the best prices, let you know about discounts, and proactively adjust your bookings when the rate goes down. And best of all, it is a free, no cost, no obligation quote. I certainly use them for everything on Coffee with Kenobi, and I highly recommend if you're considering a Disney World vacation or Disneyland that you look them up. You can go to our affiliate link, which can be found on social media or at the top of our webpage to find out more. And please let them know that Dancy and Coffee with Kenobi sent you. The show Jeff McGee and Matt Moore of the Star Wars Splash page join me as we take another look at The Rise of Skywalker. It's been out for a while now. I don't even think it's in most theaters anymore. So it's pretty much nearing at the end of its theatrical run. So we've had a little bit of time to think about some concepts and things that happen in this film. And to be honest, there's still a few things that are not sitting really well with me. And the best way to, for me to process that is to talk with all of you. And Matt and Jeff are going to help us to kind of break things down from the rise of Skywalker as far as some key points that I want to explore a little bit further. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. Joining me today for a cup of coffee are the hosts of the Star Wars Splash page. First, let's bring in Matt Moore. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you for coming back to the show, good sir. How's, how's life treating you? I have no complaints. I'm doing okay for an old guy. An old guy? You're, you're, a, you're a spring chicken. I wish. <laughs> I spring them, my spring done sprung. Oh, well, I don't know how to transition from that to our next guest. Um, but I'm sure he has something in mind. That is, of course, the other host of the Star Wars Splash page and, you know, our little buddy, Jeff McGee. At the risk of being predictable, it's it's not so much the years as it is the mileage with this crew, I think. Is that Jeff's way of saying that he's going to be cast in Indiana Jones number five? I think so. I mean, we've been waiting for this moment for a while, so it's good that we're doing it. I already own the fedora, so, you know, it makes sense. It's just you're practically there. That, that was really the, the deciding factor. And you have the swagger. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, speaking of swagger, but not, not really, uh, let's talk about <laughs> The Rise of Skywalker. It's been out for over a month and a half. No, no, well, yeah, mm, pretty close. And now I'm pretty sure, gentlemen, that it's not in theaters anymore. So I believe it has ended its theatrical run. There may be some theaters here and there that are still showing it. But as far as I can tell, it's done in theaters. Does that sound right? I believe it's actually even fallen out of the top 10. So, yeah. I think it is. I mean, there's a couple of theaters in and around me in between Philly and uh, the Trenton, New Jersey that have it. So I, I, I may go hit it again this week. Okay. How many times have you both seen it so far? I've, I've seen it three times now. Okay. And what about you, Jeff? It's same for me. I've seen it three times. I saw it uh, opening night in uh, regular 2D. Then I went and saw it in IMAX 3D the next day. And then the following weekend, I went to see it in D-Box, which was a lot of fun. Oh, wow. I've never seen anything in D-Box before. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, my, my next goal, I was hoping to get to see it in like a 4DX because we have a couple of theaters that do something similar to that around here, but just didn't time out right. Right. No, that that makes sense. I mean, plus, you know, I mean, life... I right. can get in the way. So, so what I'm going to do, um, I've seen it four times still. Uh, I haven't seen it since we did our big review show. We really haven't talked about this show since the last review show, which is kind of crazy. But there have been premieres and The Mandalorian and lots of other events going on. Uh, we did some live events. But now we need to circle back. I think we've had a lot of time for a lot of points in The Rise of Skywalker to sort of settle. And so I'm going to bring up, I've got... I believe, let's see, one, two, three. Uh, I've got about seven points that I want to bring up and I want to hear your guys' takes. And I'm 
I mean, I've made no secret of it on other shows and online. While I like The Rise of Skywalker, I do not love it. Uh, in fact, if I were to rate all of the Star Wars movies, I think this might be the lowest one for me. And wow. again, that, that's I know that's not that's not so, necessarily a bad thing, but it's just there are some things in here that uh, I am just sort of struggling with. But I think it's okay. Again, as we always say, critical thinking, intellectual honesty are great things. Certainly okay to disagree, but we're not going to be disagreeable because that's not what we do on the show, and that's not what the two of you do either. So we we have a lot of things I think to break down that, is, that give us a lot of material, but. Matt, we'll do, when we do these, we'll just have you go first, Matt, and then Jeff, just so it's easier. But Age Matt, before beauty makes sense. Well, there you go. Um, Matt, as, as time has gone on, how have your feelings for the rise of Skywalker sort of evolved? They have, uh, this is surprising for me because, uh, you know, Rise of Skywalker uh, has had, it, it's been a di- diametrically opposite effect than when I saw The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens. Each time that I, I watched the movie, I found four little things to sort of nitpick and then that would also sort of needle at me afterward as I was, as I was thinking about it. So while I still enjoyed seeing it each time, my joy was dampened each time afterward. Uh, yeah. And, and I, that sounds kind of odd. It's just that I, the more I watched, the more I realized, well, that could have been an opportunity or you know, this was a missed opportunity or what do you mean Poe was a spice runner? What? So. Right, which we're definitely going to talk about. I think that's, no, that's a good way to put it. Like, I I like it, but every time I go, I don't leave thinking, oh, I liked it a little bit better. I liked it a little bit better. Or I saw this more, but it sort of has the opposite effect. It has it has less less impact on me. Now, what about you, Jeff? In, in, you know, it's it's been very similar to, to Matt's experience, um, maybe with a little less pronounced, because when when I left the film the first time, I would say I was whelmed. Not overwhelmed, not underwhelmed, just whelmed. And uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the expectation I had going in because I had really, uh, thankfully, done a good job of tempering my own expectations. Uh, and each time I watched it, aside from the fact that each one was a completely different experience, you know, 2D, then 3D, then D-Box, um, I, I felt like I was seeing the same movie every single time. And I... I didn't necessarily enjoy it less each time, but um, it's interesting. Overall, I had less of a, of a reaction to it, but individual moments hit me harder. Uh, For Mm -hmm. instance, um, Chewie's reaction to finding out that Leia was gone, uh, Leia's actual death and um, Kylo Ren talking to uh, Han Solo. Uh, those initial in, individual moments hit me harder in, in a good way. Uh, but again, overall, kind of like you guys said, each time it kind of made me less enthused about going back to it again. Yeah, felt, felt more like homework each time. Sure. No, I I think that's a pretty apt comparison as well. The 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 moments like you said that that hit really resonate. I mean, the the chewy one is is the most powerful I think in the entire film. I think the last 10 minutes are perfect. I've always felt that way. Uh, and there are certain things that I like that wrapped up. This is also my favorite Adam Driver performance and my favorite um, experience with Kylo Ren on the big screen for sure. But there's some other things that don't work for me. So I'm going to start bringing up these points and I want to see kind of where you two are at on them. And I'm curious to see what everyone else uh, in the coffee with Kenobi family, what, what do you all think about this one as well? So the first one I'm going to bring up, Matt, is Ray's lineage. And I'll hold my comments until both you and Jeff kind of weigh in, but w- tell me how, where you sit on Ray's lineage. I am still mixed on that. Uh, I get the, I, I, I love the notion uh, that she adopted the Skywalker mantle uh, because of the connection she felt with not just Luke, but also Leia. But yet at the same time, I, you know, the more I think about it, uh, and the more I, uh, you know, read what other people have to say or discuss with them, their their feelings and their opinions, I do see the logic in the claims that uh, her agency was taken away. Uh, you know that you know that you know she you know she we saw her in the Force Awakens as Ray Nobody, 
and here she here she did over the course of three films made herself into a somebody and then adopted the name of the, you know the, the the name of the people who helped help her transform although underlying everything was the fact that she is the one who who, who transformed herself so i'm still it, it's still a very very fine line for me i I, part of me would would have really loved to have seen that end scene, you know, where she looked over and saw Luke and Leia, you know, and, and, you know, you know, the Force Ghost, and just said, "I'm Ray." And then in the movie, or Ray, just Ray. I, I, I would be very much at peace with that as well, Jeff. What about you? Yeah, uh, Matt stole my answer. Um. <laughs> he kind of stole mine too. It's beautifully said. It did. Uh, my favorite moment in uh, the Last Jedi, uh, not my favorite scene. My favorite scene was the uh, the throne room battle. But my favorite moment was when Ray found out that her parents were nobody. I thought that was a, a brilliant idea. I thought it was a very brave move on the part of Ryan Johnson. And and like Matt said, I I thought it really it it, it made it so that the the force was for everyone. You know, your your lineage didn't so much matter. It just mattered your connection to the force. And my initial reaction to finding out that she was uh, Uncle Palpy's granddaughter, uh, first off, I, I just kind of thought it was dumb. The idea of a granddaughter. I, I don't know why, but it just took me out of took me out of the film. And it never has sat right with me. I can overlook it. It doesn't it's not ruinous, but uh, I, I never liked it. I much preferred the idea that that this person, this, this strong figure, male, female, whatever, but this strong female figure was, was her own person, just like Matt was saying. And, and I feel like I, I don't think it necessarily took her agency away. I, I get where she was going with it. And I get why she decided to take on the name Skywalker because she obviously wanted to leave the name Palpatine behind, but I would have much preferred to hear her say, Ray, who just Ray, but that's, Otherwise, they couldn't have called the movie The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I just I have to agree. I I feel like it, I, I think it was a misstep. Um, and I've said before that this and I think I, I, I can't remember. I think it was Corey Club on the roundtable that we did said this felt like a sequel to a movie we never got. And that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, this, this this felt very disconnected from anything that had come before. And that was a big part of it because it, it came from it literally came from out of nowhere. Yeah, the the when I saw this for the first time and it was revealed that she was a Palpatine, I actually groaned. Like I audibly groaned, like uh, because I I just felt like, uh, like you both said. I mean, look, it's no secret that we all love the Last Jedi. I mean, if if to me, if not for a Canto bite dragging on as much as it did, I could easily see the Last Jedi as being my favorite Star Wars film. Agree, maybe you know what I mean. It's just yeah. it's perfection. It's incredibly smart. It's profound. And what it sets up in the beginning of the film, it wraps up at the end of the film. Uh, and I like the mystery. I like the ambiguity. Star Wars is best when there's a little bit of ambiguity, but we also get some resolution as well. We didn't get either in this movie, I don't think. Uh, and I wanted Ray to just be Ray. I mean, whether she's a Palpatine or a Skywalker or a Kenobi or a McGee or whatever she's going to be, like... Whatever they decide to do, I think it would have been better if they didn't. That being said, I'm not someone who's going to quibble. I don't think any of us are about how a story is told. I mean, the creators do what they do. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's always going to work for us. And I thought Ray, I still think that Ray is powerful. I still think that Ray, as you said, Matt, she still makes these choices that define who she is. Uh, clearly, she's not going to want to keep the Palpatine name. But I just don't, I just don't think we need a Palpatine at all. Now, let's be clear, a celebration when, when Ian McDermott came out and we heard the laugh of Palpatine, that was a thrill like no other. That was fantastic. And maybe we should just kind of split this off into Palpatine himself because I feel like either this was a wasted opportunity or an opportunity that wasn't necessarily something that added to the Skywalker saga, that added to the Star Wars mythology. Because even now, or even if you look at Pablo's book, you know, with, with, the, with the visual guide, we have no indication of what's going on. With this guy, is he a clone? Is he actually Palpatine uh, hooked up on a lot of uh, life support? In, in essence, 
or what the deal is with that. So I don't know. I just felt like it was it was something that wasn't really needed in the story. Didn't add to the story. If anything, it was kind of a distraction. Personally, I thought it would have been a lot better if this was about psychology of Kylo Ren and Ray sort of coming to grips with who who she is and who she wants to be. That still sort of happened, but the circuitous route that they took didn't necessarily work for me. Which brings me to the next point. Uh, and I, at the end, we can talk about it. There's anything that you, we didn't talk about that you guys want to bring up. But the next point I want to bring up is Ben's redemption and death. Now, Matt, there's been a lot of consternation about whether he deserves to be redeemed or not, as well as the fact that he dies at all. Um, personally, I think this is one of the things that works in the movie. But, Matt, what about you? I always believe when they announced the title of The Rise of Skywalker that it was going if the, if the Skywalker in reference was Ben. Even though he bears Ben Solo, he is of Skywalker blood. He is, you know, he is Skywalker blood. And I felt that they they carried that through from the start of uh, the uh, you know, from you know, start of the sequel trilogy to the conclusion of the sequel trilogy, and that it was Ben who rose. He rose to the occasion. It took him long enough to realize it, but he did finally rise. I see why the script writers and the filmmakers felt that he should die because it, it provides a convenient ending, if you will. Uh, you know, I mean, just set the stage for whatever adventures may come for the sequel trilogy characters. Uh, yet at the same time, I think Ben should not have actually died. I do believe he should have lived. And in my head canon, which granted is a scary place to be, <laughs> he and Ray are on Tatooine training the next generation of Jedi, serving as a sort of yin and yang, you know, a balance between, you know, those, the, the, you know, the dyad bringing the balance to the force and teaching the new generation and the next generation how to use not just the light, but the dark without having to have these absolute you know, these black and white and, you know, and, and melding, if you will, almost the two schools. And, you know, he was never a Sith, obviously. Right. He was clearly influenced by Sith lore and Sith teaching. But if you had the two of them together, I think, you know, the next, the next crop of Jedi would have been the manifestation of the force brought it into balance. Because you would have had real people or real real creatures, <laughs> not just people, uh, exercising their power in the force uh, and and doing it in a manner much like life itself, you know, full of vagaries and concerns and uh, you know extreme uh, mood swings from one from you know one area to the next, and at the same time, you know, utilizing both the light and the dark find that common ground and that center line do what's best. Because you, you know, you don't have evil, good's out of a job. You don't have good, evil's out of a job. And everything's very boring. Right, you need balance. Take the two and you balance it like, you know, like the scales of yours. And then you go with it. And that's gone. Uh, you know, that, that's gone forever. Uh, you know, I just, I didn't think it was the proper way to end the sequel trilogy. And frankly, after having waited since 1977 to see how the Skywalker saga ended, you know, I, I feel hollow. Uh, you know, I'm like, wait, wait, no, wait, no, 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 we, no. We need a Skywalker and a Solo, even if it's, even if they're just the service teachers, you know. And, and we pitch the, for, the story forward to the next generation, which I'm all for. But now we only have a Skywalker. That's how I feel about that. All right? No, I appreciate your honesty, and I think I think a lot of people will relate to this. Jeff, what about you? I mean, obviously, you are probably the biggest Han Solo fan I know. Uh, and until Matt said, I didn't even think about the fact that, gosh, they're 
the solo line is done. I mean, the Skywalker line is, is sort of done too, in a way. Gosh, that yeah, they're, they're really both hard. done. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we assume that you know Han doesn't have any other, you know, illegitimate kids out there, um, which is a very real possibility. But um, I have that mouth right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not buying that either. Um, I'm saying he lived. He lived a long, a large life before he met Leia. Uh, but um, I, I didn't have as big of a problem with with Kylo Ren dying uh, as Matt did, which is to say, I didn't have much of a problem at all for the simple fact that I don't know that there's a place for him in this world after the horrendous death toll and destruction that Kylo Ren had caused. Yeah, at his own hand and and by his own command. I don't know if the galaxy could ever see him as anything other than a killer and, and, and a dictator. Uh, and so I, I, I think, I think that was ultimately the way his story had to end. His, his story was a story of redemption, just like Anakin Skywalker's was, uh, through the, uh, the original trilogy. And I, I just, like I said, I, I don't know. I, I think I, it would have been very interesting and it would have been very satisfying to see he and Ray end up together, especially since they were the only two characters who understood one another in the entire trilogy. You mean together as in romantically? Romantically or otherwise that, you know, they, they clearly there, there was a connection there, but they were the only two characters who really understood one another at the end of the last Jedi. And it was, it was set up a really interesting dynamic between ultimate good and ultimate evil being the only two characters that could really, that were really connected and really understood one another. So from that standpoint, I think it would have been interesting to see what happens. But uh, again, I, I think I, I don't think there's a place for Kylo Ren in this universe because mm-hmm. there, there's a place for Ben Solo, obviously, but I don't know that the vast majority of people, especially people who lost loved ones to this war would ever see Ben Solo as anything other than Kylo Ren. I, so I think ultimately that's, yeah. that's the only way his character could have ended. No, I agree. And I, and I thought it was, I thought it was nice. And the return to sort of the Shakespearean idea of, the tragic hero realizes his flaws at the end and then it's too late, but would they die with dignity? And he did. I mean, what he does when he dies is he saves Ray's life. I mean, he absolutely saves her life. Plus he learns an ability that I'm assuming only someone in the light side of the force could actually wield because it involves healing and a selfless act that brings about life instead of death. And it's not about a uh, self or, or power. It's about helping. It's about rising someone, helping someone. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, sure, it would be great to have get a, an, an animated series or some books or a sequel, but I, I don't. I just don't imagine that Adam Driver would have been up for that. I mean, it doesn't mean he wouldn't be. I just don't know that there's enough story there. We don't need another story about a brave, a mighty Skywalker or a Solo dashing around. I mean, we've we've got that already. Sure, it would be fun, and yes, I understand why people would want it. But I agree with you. There's really no mu- not much more place for him in this universe. It was a selfless act, and he needed to find his identity. He finally made peace with who he was. Could have been done a little bit more strongly. I mean, perhaps. I mean, you could possibly say anything about Anakin Skywalker, too. I mean, really. A lot of the a lot of the narrative weight is sort of things that we have put together in our heads, and we've connected some dots naturally and organically through the history of the storytelling of Star Wars. And that's okay, too. I mean, that's what a myth does at its core anyway. It, it gives you a story, but it also allows for you to interpret. And I think that's great. Now, did he deserve to be redeemed? I mean, I mean, from a Christian perspective, anybody deserves to be redeemed, quite honestly. Uh, did he do enough? I don't know. Did Darth Vader do enough? I mean, that's a whole other debate as well. But I think it worked in this context. And I thought it was beautiful. And, and I, I mentioned this on the review show, but even John Williams takes takes the, the Kylo Ren theme and and makes it lighter to reflect uh, we had a great conversation on Twitter today about, you know, Ben wasn't really redeemed. He and Harrison did, or Han Solo didn't forgive him. That was what Ben told himself. Well, maybe, but I believe that then Han Solo loved his son, and I believe he sacrificed himself for his son in the hopes of getting him to to turn to back to the to the graces of the good side of the Force. And obviously, that didn't happen then. It ultimately does happen. 
and we get this poignant ending, which again, I think worked really well. We haven't even talked about the kiss. I don't really know that there's much to say about that. We've talked about that before, but all adds up to a, a really beautiful ending, but something that wasn't quite as beautiful. And Matt, you alluded to this already, Poe Dameron. So Poe Dameron, thanks to Charles Soule, especially is one heck of a character. And of course, Oscar Isaac is a, is a massive part of that. The biggest part for that. I love Poe in the force awakens. I love that. Yes, he's very sure of himself, but I never thought of him as cocky. He's a great pilot. He takes some risks, but he ultimately wants the right thing. In The Last Jedi, he means well, but things go bad, uh, and it's a reasonable thing that could happen. And then in and then we get you know Resistance Reborn and a lot of different stories that have gone on between The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, that year period. There's a lot that can happen there and a lot that already has in the canonical Star Wars. But in this one, Matt, I felt like he was a completely different character. Uh, and I saw someone else say I, that they thought he was a different character in every film. I think that's fair. I, and I'm not just crazy about, I don't know. Uh, when, I'll put it this way. When I found out that there was going to be a novel about him younger when he was a spy runner, I thought, eh, eh, I don't know. Will I read it? I mean, I'm sure I probably will. I've read about everything else. But I feel like Poe was a little bit lost. And I don't feel like... If we're going to have these stories in the middle of the movies and we're, we're going to have them connecting, well then let's have, let's have it make sense where we actually see evolution or progression of the character in some way. And, and, and Matt, quite frankly, with Poe Dameron, I don't feel like we got that at all. My issue with Poe was, was essentially this. You know, the way we saw him portrayed in The Rise of Skywalker, uh, it completely undid you know, the events uh, of the final arc of the Poe Dameron comic book series. I agree. Uh, you know, because, if, 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 you know, in issue 31, you know, he was there with Black Squadron, uh, and, you know, he was finding his footing, you know, he, you know, he, he did still wrestling internally, you know, with his, his actions regarding Admiral Holdo, but then, you know, he, he was able to rally Black Squadron, uh, you know, and, and I think rediscover within himself his natural leadership and his and his natural drive to do the right thing, and then I read and then of course I read Resistance Reform, which I really enjoyed a lot. And we, you know, and we, in in that novel, you know, Poe was still wrestling with himself with his actions and trying, you know, because you know he and Ray and everyone else in that novel were having to deal with the awesome crushing weight of of, of the galaxy, you know. Uh, in the face of, in, of, you know, what were insurmountable odds. And by the time we got to the end of that novel, I felt that he had sort of made his peace with that, you know, and was, you know, come what may, I am ready. And then we get into the rise of Skywalker, and it transferred a lot of that from the novel into the film. But, if, you know, if you, go, if you went into the rise of Skywalker without having read that novel or, or, read, or having read Poe Dameron, the comic, I'm, you know, I would not be surprised in the least if you were like, wait, what? Who is, is that? Poe Dameron again? <laughs> what? Uh, you know, and and then it took, <clears throat> it literally, it took the death of Leia for him to rediscover himself again and and rekindle that fire, uh, you know, that self confidence and that and that and that assuredness of okay, we can do this, we can lead, we we may not win, but we will not. You know, we will not be, we will not go down in flames. We will put up a fight. And, you know, and I found that to be very stirring. But, but then when, you know, they, you know, they throw in this, oh, yeah, you know, he and Zori ran spice together. But no, <sighs> wait a minute. <laughs> you know, that's what? <laughs> There's been no mention of that. And I can see perhaps it was done in there because they needed to give a tie-in to, you know, to Zori. Am I, is, 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 no, yeah, Zori. Zori or Corey? I'm, I'm Zori. Zori, yeah, yeah, what's Zori. But uh, and then after, yeah, and that took, you know, because I love Poe Dameron. He's my he's my favorite sequel trilogy character, you know, and I love the Poe Dameron comic, as, as listeners to the show will know uh, and, and recall. But it just it just seemed to go against everything that we had known about him. You know that he was fairly, you know, yeah, he you know he liked to buck the system. Uh, you know, but that's because he was just, you know, he was so good. You know, he was, he's the Star Wars equivalent of Maverick from Top Gun. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and, 
whether that's intentional or, or coincidental, I, I don't care. Uh, but, you know, it's not like I could see Maverick, you know, having, you know, you know, sold, you know, having sold weed in college before you know, he, he joined the, the, you know, the Navy. But, uh, you know, so I'm just kind of curious to see where we're going to go, where they're going to go with this and what, what impact it's going to have on the character, you know, whether to his, to his detriment or to his, you know, benefit that he was a spice runner. I mean, I could see it happening, you know, for, you know, he's young, he's chafing under his dad's uh, yoke. His mom has passed away. He's rebelling. So he, you know, Hey, I'm the best pilot in the galaxy. You know, you know, you know, you know, who needs good pilots? Smuggler. So he falls in with, you know, spice runners. And then, you know, then he got comes to his senses and he, all right, I'm going back home. going to join the new Republic Navy. It's going to be all good. But it was just, it was way out of left field for this to come in like that. So, yeah. And maybe Leia is the one who pulls him out of the slump. I mean, I mean, I guess that we do see how he gets recruited, so maybe not. But I don't know. It's more like whether there's a novel in between or not, is there a logical progression of character from the end of The Last Jedi to the rise of Skywalker? And maybe there is. I mean, maybe he's so downtrodden from The Last Jedi that in The Rise there's of no, Skywalker, um, there, maybe he will be a little bit like that. There was, but you, you, but you had to have read Resistance Reborn to see it. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, you know, there was there, you know, without having read that novel, I, I think the gap may have just been too wide for the casual viewer. And that's what I mean. And like you said, in the novel, it feels like he made peace with it. And all of a sudden in the story, that sort of is gone. I feel like yeah. that's kind of gone. And and for all the, the Ballyhoo thing about the three of them being together again, uh, Ray, Finn and Poe, and actually spending some screen time together, really besides some banter, uh, early on, after Poe does a good job of wrecking up the Falcon, they really don't interact at all, and that's oh. that's a bit of a mis misstep too. Yeah. Do you have anything for you on Poe? What, what was the question? I just how do you feel about Poe? His arc, uh, his place in oh, the story. I'm just being just being a, being a jack uh, a jack wagon. Um, I, I'm like Matt. Poe was was my favorite character from the sequel trilogy. And that is down to nothing other than Oscar Isaac's performance uh, because the writers did him no favors. He was supposed to be the Han Solo of this trilogy. And it felt like they just never knew what to do with him. It was almost like his storylines were an afterthought. And that's fine. If you want to focus on, on Ray and to a, to a lesser extent, uh, Finn as the secondary lead, that kind of does leave Poe out in the cold, but uh, much like everything else in the rise of Skywalker, it felt like we're getting, we're still getting new information about this character. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it felt like it was nothing but new information. We weren't seeing this character progress until Leia dies. And he decides it's time to grow up and, and, and be a leader. But that was all told to us. We didn't see any of that in his character. And again, finding out these new layers to him, didn't add much to his character because we never had time to spend with him. He seemed to be pretty much the same character at the end of the, at the end of the film as he was at the beginning of uh, the rise of Skywalker or uh, the force awakens. The only exception being he's still trying to hook up with Sora. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it felt like they were trying to make him a character that he didn't want to be. Or that he wasn't. He wasn't in the other two films. I just felt like he was the, exactly. the, the biggest misstep in characterization, which I'm not used to in Star Wars. I mean, you know, th these characters are not perfect, and that's that's fine. I mean, we love them. But at least they're the, pretty similar, you know, as far as how they are, who they are in each film. And in Poe, it was quite a bit different. So that's another that it, that is still kind of a challenge for me, and I don't know if – I'm never going to make peace with that. And really, you shouldn't have to do that much work after the movie's done to kind of make your peace. With that. But, you know, we will certainly discuss it a lot. Let's go ahead and take a break. Speaking of that, Tom's going to have some news when we come back. Matt, Jeff, and I will talk a little bit more about The Rise of Skywalker, what worked, and what we're still sort of marinating on. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Rise of the Resistance is now open on both coasts, Walt Disney World and Disneyland. So you need to be sure and book some experiences to the East and West Coast. You can experience Star Wars, Galaxy's Edge, and Rise of the Resistance. And I can think of no better way to do that than through MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize the vacation time and dollar. Their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service is really wonderful. And they also proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. They will help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer, help plan every detail, and will share invaluable tips. Be sure to go to our affiliate link, which can be found in the show notes on the front of our webpage or on our social media, and sign up for a free, no obligation quote. You'll have the best vacation possible and... Help out Coffee with Kenobi in the process, so be sure to tell them that Dan Z and Coffee with Kenobi sent you. I would love to take this opportunity to thank our CWK Patreon contributors. Jason Hall, Dennis Keithley, Colby Mead, Jessica Berry, Adam Bankhurst, David Nicely, Jeff Ellis, Ross Halliban, Frank Mulder, Alexander Moylan, Aaron Harris, Chris Kavarka, Angela Sauce, Susan Gray, Connie Shee, Tyler Pompa, Hannah, Yancey Evans, Alex Procasio, Ian Thompson, Simbot Detradarian, Christine Turk, Sean Reed, Kurt McKillen, Dan Ream, Brian Harding, Blake Weaver, Jim Capron, Caroline Maselli, Chris Metz, LJ Souter, Thea Selby, Daz Davies, Christian Dale, Brian McKinney, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco, and Mark Suter. As a Coffee with Kenobi Patreon contributor, you help out our show in so many ways. The web hosting, the fees that go into it, upgrading our equipment, the travel, the things that we need to do to cover the different events. It all is because of your Patreon contributions and generosity. But you also get something out of it as well. For $5 or more a month, you get access to CWK Pourover, which is our weekly podcast not heard anywhere else, hosted by myself, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. And for $10 or more a month, you get access to CWK Lens, for behind-the-scenes video and images as well. So if you're curious about this and want to find out more, go to www.patreon.com slash coffeewithkenobi and check out all the things we offer. And be sure to ask me any questions that you have. we love to have you support and be a part of our Coffee with Kenobi Patreon family. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for your consideration. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait, this is interesting. You found something. I'm about to let everyone in on the secret. It's time for some coffee with Kenobi Star Wars news. And we don't really have like a, I mean, we've got that fun little slogan musical intro at the beginning that Corey made years and years ago. But we don't really have like a, here's Tommy, you know, something like that. (laughs) We have to come up with something like that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that would be great. I think after after a little bit of time, we, you know, maybe we need a... uh need a little intro a news do 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 and then bah, star wars yeah all right news wouldn't that be fun interesting well <laughs> this is tom gross for those of you who weren't aware i'm sure you already are but tom you've got some star wars news to share with us i do and i promise i won't sing during any of the newscast <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was announced this week that Hasbro will be releasing a new toy vehicle in its vintage line. The Imperial Troop Transport was first released without any screen footage back in 1979. But since then, it's had its first screen action in The Mandalorian, of course. And it was also seen many times on Lothal in the animated series Rebels. Now that it has screen time, it's time for a revival. The Imperial Troop Transport will be released this spring with a retail price of sixty. And the Vintage Line Edition has a similar exterior look with the exterior troop compartments on the sides, front cockpit doors that open, and uh, you can put an action figure inside, a rotating turret on the top. But unlike the 1979 version, the back opens to a troop compartment complete with fold-down seats and weapons compartment. The Vintage Collection vehicle certainly uh, holds a more realistic look than the original toy. Yeah, so when this was sent to me by Hasbro, I ran and talked to you about it, and you told me a little nugget that I'm just so incredibly envious of, and and share that with our friends. 
Oh, yes. Um, I have one of these. I remember getting it as a uh, child, of course. And, um, and I remember playing with it, but always thinking, I don't even know if this is Star Wars. I mean, it said it's Star Wars, but I've never seen this before. And so, you know, what's interesting about it is it does not have a lot of play hours to it. So it's in pretty good condition, except for the stickers over the years have uh, peeled up a little bit. So, um, you know, I may have to pull that out and do a little CWK office pick with the yeah. Imperial, the original Imperial Tramp. Troop transport, and uh, looking at the pictures of the vintage line, the vintage line has a much more realistic look to it, whereas the old original 1979 transport has, you know, more of a toy uh, look to it. So, yeah, that's a good dis- dis- comparison. <laughs> yeah, but it, it definitely looks looks very cool, and it's very uh, vintage in the toy line, but new uh, with an you know the on screen feel. So, it's a fun piece to have, and uh, definitely will be a unique piece to any collection. I wish it looked more like the original. Uh, of oh, course, because right? I never got I never got the original one, and I, and I always thought mm. it was cool. Uh, because it had, it supposedly had sound effects, and from the, I doubt it was oh. really the movies. But I, when yeah. I was a kid, I'm sure I would have noticed, but I wouldn't have bothered me because it would have been neat. I mean, you know, the Falcon and the X-wing from Kenner, those don't have really the same sounds as the movie, but they're still fun. They're classic in their own way, and yeah. I'm pretty sure that that Dave took some of the the sound effects from the original toys and put them into the to the Ghost sound effects when it was firing the cannons. Mm, yes, the sounds, um, that sounds right, doesn't it? I think it is. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, um, and people could probably correct me on this if I'm wrong, but if I recall correctly, on the troop transport, you had like a running engine sound, and you mm-hmm. also had the the turret firing sound. But I may never know because if I recall correctly, the batteries sat in that for. Oh, probably all the way through my college years. And, you know, you took a old butter knife to dig it out of there with all the corrosion and everything. Yeah. So I don't know that my, the battery compartment still works. And I don't know that I'd ever get sounds out of that anymore, but the rest oh, yeah, of it looks, try. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I will. I will. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually thinking a nice CWK office pick with the troop transport right next to my ad at. So, so that'll be very cool. That'll be amazing. And you've got a lot of great classic stuff. I did order this, by the way. Oh, you did? Yeah, I clicked on it, um, and it was already sold out on Amazon. I mean, it's all pre-order, but yeah. it, was, it was sold out there. It was closed on Best Buy, a couple places. But I finally found it on a big bad toy store and pre-ordered it. So, uh, Very and, nice. I, and I actually kind of pre-ordered before I looked at it fully, but I'm still happy I got it. I mean, I loved seeing it in The Mandalorian, and it does show up in Season 4 of Rebels, too. Yes, it does. Um, so I'm just curious. Uh, the story that I, the research that I got for my story said that it just had a, a general spring release. Did, when you ordered it, did it give you a date? I thought it said March. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. So, seeing it actually. Mm, sooner than later, then. That's, that's yeah. cool. That's pretty cool. I, I look forward to seeing that when, you, when it comes in. Oh, for sure. So, well, speaking of The Mandalorian, how about the announcement that came out this week on StarWars.com that Bob Iger made Season 2 of The Mandalorian official during an earning call uh, with um, with uh, stockholders. So the second season of The Mandalorian now is official to be released in October of 2020. So it's great, right? And also they yes. also said that he's planning on having some characters – perhaps spinning off under their own thing for the, the world of the Mandalorian too. Mm, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And one thing that I thought of timing wise, it's nice because you have a lot of people coming up with renewals for Disney plus at that time. Well, not oh, quite at that time, yeah. but by the time the season is about mid season to wrapping up, there'll be a number of people. Um, uh, oh no, no. It, it, Cause it came out in, in November. So yes, actually just, about three or four episodes in, you'll be wanting to renew your Disney Plus subscription. So I'm sure that's not accidental, but you know what? Who wasn't? I mean, I, you know, who's not thinking about renewing? <laughs> well, that's an astute observation. Uh, yeah, very savvy. I, that is that's that's got to be some uh, some pearls in that, I would say. And and gosh, I mean, I obviously we're gonna keep Disney Plus for as long as as Disney Plus wants to keep us. <laughs> mm-hmm. Indeed. And so it's great. And like I said this on this week's Looking at Lucasfilm, but as far as spinoffs go, as long as they still, yes, yeah, spinoff, give us more stuff, that's great. But still keep 
these characters around in the world of the Mandalorian too, just because of the chemistry and they all bring out the best in one another. So I hope we kind of get the best of both worlds there. Um, I would completely agree. So, but it's nice to get the official from the, uh, from the top guy. That's that, right. Uh, that work. Cause we got, we got, I believe didn't Favreau on the last episode, uh, give us a tease on Twitter about, um, season two. Yeah. So, I, showed, you know, uh, I showed a slim Gamorrean guard. Ah, that's right. And so, you know, I, I usually consider that to be the top guy, but this is the guy that writes the checks. So, yeah, he's he's the top. He's the top, <laughs> the top. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of top of the top, how about some top toys here? The Lego Ideas blog re- re- released the results of the fan voting for the next Star Wars Ultimate Collector Series set. The Republic gunship, the L-A-T-T-I beat out EF-76 Nebulan, e- Nebulan B Escort Frigate. Doggone it. I was really th- thinking I was going to get through that without stumbling. Um, it beat out that and the TIE Bomber. So the gunship got over 50% of the votes from fans for to be the next um, UCS. The blog reports that it can't currently reveal any details, but the gunship will be the next UCS Star Wars set. So this is really, really cool. Do you have any idea what, what some of the previous sets were? Yeah. Um, let's see. Going back most recently, the Imperial Star Destroyer was in 2019. The year before that was the Y-Wing Starfighter. Then 2017 had two of them, Snowspeeder and Millennium Falcon. So there's uh, that one. And then just as I'm looking through the list, it goes clear back to 2000. And so just uh, I'm just going to give you a sampling of some of these. There's I see a couple of Death Stars, a Cloud City, General Grievous, uh, Tantiv IV, um, so a whole bunch of uh, cool things. Ewok Village. Um, they also have UCS for uh, the Marvel Shield helica- helicarrier. Wow. And and a DC Batmobile. And looks like the Batmobile is the main subject of. Uh, they got about four different ones of those. So some really cool sets. And I know I've seen a few of these in person, and they are they are detailed. Um, the I saw a the one of the Falcon uh, sets uh, just recently and. I mean, the top just comes apart and shows all the inside of the Falcon in detail. It's, they're really cool. They're really cool sets. They're probably more advanced than what I would like to take the time to put together. But the people who love Legos and love Star Wars, this is this is their jam. And Yeah, it's and, perfect. You know, it's like uh, peanut butter and chocolate. It is. And when I think about the Rebel gunship, there's got to be a lot of like – you know, a thing, the thing that Lego people love are unique pieces, one of a kind pieces. And I would sure think the Republic gunship would probably have a lot of those with its curvature and, um, unique, oh, yeah. um, gun, uh, that, that, that dome in the, in the, in the bottom of it that shoots that laser out. So anyway, I think it'd be a really cool, uh, ship and I can't wait to see one put together. Well, while I was doing a little research today, I thought I'd share that I discovered a nice little article on StarWars.com that I think everyone should check out. Now that most of us have taken the time to sit back and relax from our viewings of The Rise of Skywalker and reflect a little bit, this article is a nice piece to do that reflection with because it covers the major themes of the film as a conclusion to the narrative. And this article just happens to be written by, well, uh, you, Mr. Dan Zare. So tell us about a little bit about how this uh, article came about and um, and where some of your thoughts came from. Sure. Well, uh, Lucasfilm asked me to write a piece about themes and connecting uh, sort of what happened in The Rise of Skywalker to previous Star Wars Skywalker films, which I was more than happy to do, of course. And it was cool because I had talked about themes in the earlier films as well. So I just kind of sat down and made a list of where I thought the main story arcs were and and kind of what was going on behind the scenes, the thematic elements and the mythological connections. And then it kind of wrote itself. It it was great fun to write. And it was, it's, it's really a thrill to, it's still, it's always a thrill to see something you write on stars.com. And and I can't remember, did I even tell you that this was happening? I completely forgot. No, no, uh, I didn't. I just, I literally was doing a little research for news tonight and I came across that article and I took a look at who the author was. And I'm like, oh, well, I know that guy. <laughs> did you laugh? <laughs> I did out loud, just like I yeah. just did right now. I love it. Uh, but no, that well, was great. It's, it's always fun to come across something that you've written for starwars.com, whether I know it's there or not. And, uh, 
And of course, I uh, enjoyed reading it. And I actually heard some uh, feedback from some people um, on it, and they really enjoyed it as well. So, um, oh wow, well, so, thank that's, you. so that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I guess to uh, to conclude uh, tonight's news, um, I wanted to take a moment to remember Alan Harris, who we remember as uh, playing the Trandoshan bounty hunter Bosk. Um, in Empire Strikes Back. But he also uh, played many other minor roles uh, through the Star Wars universe. And I believe I saw that he was also the first to screen test the original white Boba Fett Mandalore armor. Um, so a film is only as strong as its smallest parts, and it's people like a- Alan Harris who made Star Wars what it is today. Alan Harris was 81 years old. Yeah, definitely rest in peace. He did a lot of, as you said, a lot of work and some stand-in stuff and he was a, he was a mainstay at conventions and james burns who i trust of course is a good friend of the show from jedi mm-hmm. news he he spoke very highly of him as well so he definitely uh thoughts and prayers to him and his family indeed there's there's quite a bit more than uh, i think we initially thought so thank you so much of course for bringing us the latest star wars news oh absolutely my pleasure we are back and i originally said that i had seven or eight points but honestly we've really broken down the original one so i'm just going to take the last two in the interest of time and bring them up we talked about poe before the break and now i want to talk about finn and i'll just kind of get my thoughts on finn out there and then matt and jeff on here what you two think for me finn is is a fascinating character i like the fact that he was a stormtrooper uh he was very much deciding what he wanted to do In the second film, he wasn't really sure, but he cared about his friends, and he wanted them safe. And yes, the conflict, he wanted to to stop the First Order, but he was more interested in his friends. At the end, he starts to make a sacrifice. Rose saves him, and then he starts to live for something else, and it was great. In this, his relationship with Rose pretty much is non-existent, a friendship or otherwise, and then his, his... his feelings for Ray, whatever they may be, romantic, friendly, brother, sister, whatever the, the case may be. He mentions he's got to tell her something, which probably was that he was force sensitive, I would guess. It's just never addressed. It, is, and, it has to be it. What's that? Th- that has to be it. It has to be. Yeah, I agree. But the fact that not only does he have a friendship with the Rose thing is non-existent, the Ray thing is just never addressed. And not an ambiguous, fun uh, Star Wars way where we know there are other things that happen. You know, you heard, you know about the Clone Wars. Yes, I was once a Jedi Knight, same as your father. All right. Eventually, we find out quite a bit about the Clone Wars, more than we ever dreamed. But it wasn't like it was just thrown out there uh, for no reason and never brought up again. There's a lot of stuff with Finn that doesn't happen. In fact, I would say he doesn't have a, an arc at all in this film, besides running around and yelling his friends' names. And then at the end, it's over. You know, and he's a good guy, and we like him, and he's heroic, and that's all great. But there's really not an arc to this character at all. Matt, you are certainly an expert in story and storytelling. What do you think about that notion that Finn may not have an arc in this movie? I kind of disagree with that notion, actually. Uh, oh, good, good. Because, you know, in The Force Awakens, we're introduced to Finn, and all he wants to do is get away, get away, get away. Go into The Last Jedi, he still wants to get away, get away, get away. But he wants, you know, let's bolt, bolt to wild space. You know, let's, let's get as far away as possible. Get to the rise of Skywalker. And to me, Ben found his footing. You know, he realized, you know, he, he, he accepted this is my family. This is where I belong. You know, I have, I have my, my, my dearest friends. I have, I have Ray. I have Poe. Or I have Poe, then I have Ray. And he set up and, became, and stepped up and became a leader. That he was willing to go into the fight to do what was right, and, and I think that was very clearly exemplified, uh, you know, when they went, to, you know, to the to the forest moon, uh, and where you know where he encountered Janna and the and the other the other former uh, uh, first order stormtroopers who had mutinied, and you know, it, and he showed his pervasive willingness to die for his family. You know, by chasing after Ray, uh, you know, as, as when she went to the to the ruins to the remnants of the Death Star, uh, he wanted to save her. Uh, you know, he 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 willingly 
uh, you know, served as as the you know that 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 the assault boat team leader when they were trying to knock out the uh, the transmitter on Exegol, you know, to stop the, uh, the the final order from actually happening. And you know, and I think he had made peace with himself and his place in the galaxy. He was no longer just FN2187. He was no longer Finn, but he was Finn of the resistance. He was Finn of the family. So I, I, I really I really liked how Finn portrayed because I felt I got to know him better as a character in the return or in the rise of Skywalker. And that's one of the high points to me for that movie. But don't you think um, he's pretty much the same at the end as he was in the beginning? Because all those wonderful points you mentioned that's how he is from the beginning of the film, and that's how he is at the end. He doesn't really go through any kind of internal struggle. I think he, you know, I, I I think he does go through some internal struggle, you know, because he's a, he's a, you know Poe appoints him co-general, and that right there is you know, it's a major it's, it's a major acknowledgement of how far Finn has come and how how well Finn has grown within himself and with being comfortable inside himself. Hmm. Uh, interesting yeah and 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 i have to i do have to uh chime in as well uh with regarding to what he was trying to tell ray <clears throat> you know when they were sinking into the quicksand and just on the side when i was young in the 80s i thought quicksand was going to be a very real problem in my life and uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to the a team and magnum pi and things like that like, but uh, uh i think what he was going to tell ray was not i love you uh, or anything no. like that, but no. it was, you know, I feel the force. Uh, you know, I, you know that that he's forced to, uh, and and I think. But here's the thing: is I think Ray knows that. I think it's sort of you know she's already inferred that, despite his level best uh, attempts not to imply it. But you know, whether or not something happens with that, who knows? Again, in my head canon, where Ben Solo is. Still dead, uh, you know. I, I see Ray training Finn, and the, you know, and the two of them going out into the into the galaxy and training others, uh, you know, to you know to be the next generation of Jedi Knights. So, but except, you know, I see I see Finn still using uh, not just a lightsaber but also a a, a a blaster. So, so real quickly, would you would you have been just as fine with Finn if he wasn't force sensitive, or do you feel like they needed to add that to his character? I don't think they needed to add it to his character. To me, it was a bonus, and that's mm-hmm. one thing that uh, kind of you know I found fascinating. You know, in, in the external debate that erupted after the film was released, uh, you know, on on social media, <clears throat> was you know uh, it seemed to me that a lot of people had overlooked the fact that just because Luke Skywalker uh, shut himself off from the force and went to hot show just because, uh, you know, snow, you know, and, you know, by extension, Palpatine, uh, destroyed Luke's Jedi Academy. It didn't mean that the force itself had been snuffed out in the galaxy. Right. You know, that, that, that energy field that binds us together, uh, you know, could not be stamped out. You know, it, it's the very underlying fabric of the Star Wars universe. And there's no way that it was going to stay out of commission just because Luke left. You know, much, much like, you know, I think we see now uh, in some of the peripheral stories that are being told in other media, you know, set in the events between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy, you know, that the Force was still alive and well, and that there were people who were tapping into it, uh, you, know, who un- you know, who were aware of it. Now, granted, you know, as, as has been made clear throughout the sequel trilogy era, you know, the force was just a legend, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and of course, and, you know, in the, in the aftermath of the prequel trilogy, you know, the Jedi became, you know, mythic, mythical, uh, you know, stories told at night, but at no point ever do I believe that the force ever actually go away. And that's no. why we have, Force sensitive, like uh, you know, the, the young boy with the broom at the end of the Last Jedi, with Ben, uh, you know, and and you know, I was having a conversation with somebody uh, at work about this. They said, "Well, you know, the First Order, you know, they would be looking for Force sensitive." I'm like, "No, they they wouldn't be, because as far as they were concerned, the Force was gone. 
the Jedi were dead. All they were worried about was one Jedi, and they couldn't find him. Yeah. So, so they had no, you know, it's not like they were, you know, they were actively recruiting or seeking out force sensitives. And the, the last, you know, that it didn't even occur to them that, you know, that they had force sensitives within their own rank. And some of them were probably, you know, there, there had to be some sort of catalyst. You know, it's like, you know, in the old, in the old Marvel Comics era, you know, from the, uh, the Bronze Age, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, when you had mutants who were first discovering their powers, it usually took some sort of catalyst for their powers to come out. You know, I mean, you know, you know, like with Rogue, it was, you know, giving a kiss, getting a kiss, and then she, you know, almost killed the, you know, she almost killed the kid who was kissing her. Uh, you know, for others, you know, it was just some traumatic event, and then, you know, that caused them to, to, to manifest their powers. And, and I think Ben, you know, his temerity uh, to leave the First Order behind awakened with him, in him, awakened within him, the force. You could say the force awakened within Ben. So. Wow. Well, that was that was good. That was I'm I um I'm interested to see what you think about that too, Jeff. Because I know, I mean, obviously you you like I know you're a big Poe guy, but you like Finn as well. I, I do like Finn, and um, man, are you on Finn's teams work? there or, or team more on this one? Um. I'm I'm sort of uh I'm I'm sort of team Jeff because I um That's good. The the poor guy <laughs> just could not kill himself. He kept trying and nobody would let him. Uh and that was a bit of a problem for me in The Force Awakens uh, in in uh, The Rise of Skywalker because at the end of the last Jedi Rose makes a point to him we don't win by killing what we hate it's by saving what we love. Right. So <clears throat> she stops him from trying to sacrifice himself. Same exact thing happens in The Rise of Skywalker, and instead of trying to stop him, uh, I I can't think of the character's name, the new character that he met on the forest moon. Um, Janna? Janna says, okay, I'm going with you. So, J.J. Abrams is the worst yes-ander in the history of improv. Because he took everything that Ryan Johnson set up, and instead of saying yes, and this, and building on it, he said, no, but and went the completely opposite direction with it. And from a storytelling perspective, it really bothered me. Uh, however, that being said, um, I, I think Finn, uh, I, I think Finn did grow through the course of the series, because when we first meet him in the force awakens again, he's a deserter. He's just trying to get away. He's trying to look out for himself. And at the end, he really is. It is a different form of sacrifice that he's trying to perform at the end of rise of Skywalker than in the last Jedi. So I will give them a little credit for that, but he he has grown into a leader. He understands he understands what what sacrifice is. He understands what needs to be done, and I, I and I love the idea of him being force sensitive and and figuring it out. I hate that it was yet another dropped plot thread. Uh, much like with Poe, we get all of these really interesting mm-hmm. character developments, and nothing happens with them. Why did we not ever see him tell Ray, "I'm force sensitive"? They're just dropping it. It this this whole movie felt like a setup for an entire expanded universe, and that was the biggest problem for me. And it was no more evident than with Finn's character. No, nope, I agree. We, we we have a lot of setup, but no payoff. And well, I, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, I I, I was nearing the end of it. I just uh, again, I but I do I do feel like he did progress. Uh, for, over the course of the trilogy, and I think the Finn that we have at the end of The Rise of Skywalker is a completely different person than the Finn that we meet at the beginning of The Force Awakens. And and I thought John Boyega, of course, is is a wonderful actor, and I thought he did a remarkable job with the, with the role. He's great. And, and to be clear, uh, my point was always in this movie, not over the overall series. He does grow in this series, but I think in this one he is he's the most stagnant. And really, I mean, to be fair, Han Solo is pretty stagnant in Return of the Jedi. I mean, his major growth comes in the Empire Strikes Back. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I could see that, but I agree that it is a dropped uh, thread that, that we don't get really much about Finn. I mean, and I don't, I have a hard time believing that J.J. or Kathleen Kennedy or Lucasfilm was thinking, no, we'll say this for the books. I think when they're making these movies, they're all about the movies. I think the creators of the books and the comics find things to tell stories about, but I don't believe for a second that they're making these movies with the intent 
of telling other stories later. I think it's just a, a fortuitous and good storytelling from all the great creatives that contribute to the Star Wars universe and in in, from the place of fiction. And I would believe that had I not, if I didn't have evidence of J.J. Abrams being able to tell far more uh, coherent stories in other films. Exactly. Exactly. I think this, I've always said that I think this is the least J.J. of all of his movies. So again, it sounds like I don't like it. I do like it. But I will go just, back to this movie more than I do uh, any of the prequels. I, I will say that. Oh, I, I don't think I will. Uh, and it, we'll see how it ages. I mean, my stance is certainly soft and on. Un- un- I've always liked episodes one and two. And I think I've liked them more as time has gone on because of the way they've aged, because the way my students have liked them, the way that my children like them. Uh, my son, Mason, does not like the Rise of Skywalker because he, he thinks the Emperor is scary. Now, Mason is six. The Emperor is scary. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that movie ages around this house, but I'm sure in time that won't even be a blip on his radar, of course. But uh, there's more points we could talk about. Uh, I think we've certainly got a lot of material here to go on and on, but there's only so much time in the day, and our coffee's getting low, and you two have got uh, other starships to fly around the galaxy, including your wonderful podcast, the Star Wars Splash page, which is blowing up the charts, gentlemen. It, it's great fun to watch. I, I reached out to both of you. Uh, you breaking down uh, Star Wars number one and the rise of Kylo Ren has is, is really been sort of transcendent for me and helped me to um, kind of look at these books a little bit differently. So I thank you for that. And that's the great stuff that you have going on each and every week on your wonderful podcast. So, Matt and Jeff, tell us about that and let us know where we can find not only the show, but both of you as well. So, Matt, let's start with you. Uh, you can find Star Wars Splash Page on Twitter and Facebook uh, at SW Splash Page Pod. You can also find us uh, on the web at Star Wars Splash, Star Wars Splash Page. <laughs> Star Wars Splash Page dot com. Took care of that for Thank you, Matt. That one, yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, uh, you can find me on Twitter at the uh, at, uh, Gorilla Scribe, and that's with uh, two R's and two L's, proper way or so. Uh, so, and you know, feel free, feel free to say hi either way. But uh, and then, of course, you can find our podcast uh, typically, uh, you know, usually every Wednesday. Maybe it might be on Thursday, but uh, we're, we're trying to do a uh, you know same day and date when the comics come out. But I'll be it later in the day. Uh, and, and so far, it's been working out pretty well. Uh, and, you know, with this new second phase of Marvel Star Wars comics you know, taking flight, uh, it's, uh, we've got some pretty good storytelling already happening. And uh, I will say this for people, uh, you know, check out Darth Vader number one this week because it's, wow, if you are a fan of the prequel trilogy and Padme Amidala in particular, you are, you are going to be very, very happy. There is a good tease right there. Jeff, tell us about uh, where they can find you and if you want to add anything to your Star Wars Splash page. And, of course, you've got uh, Marvin Dog Media, which you haven't mentioned yet on the show. That's kind of a record. I, I know. I, I, I To be honest, I, would, I couldn't figure out a way to shoehorn it in. Uh, it's all part of, all part of my, uh, my, my goal to start getting everyone else to promote my stuff instead of me. Uh, no, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as Matt said, Star Wars Splash Page, we've been trying to get it out on Wednesdays. And, again, sometimes it's Thursdays, just depending on, you know, life gets in the way. But it does come out weekly, uh, even if there are no books to discuss. I don't know if you can hear my dog sneezing next to me. Um, even if there are no books to discuss, we have something to say. So you can always find us there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Jeff McGee or at Marvin Dog Media, all one word. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for Margo to stop. Can you hear? Her? Yes, that's okay. okay. It's kind of cute. Yeah, uh, you'll have to. Can, you'll have to uh, excuse Margo. She. Uh, my dog has allergies. I have I have the broken dog. Uh, but uh, as I said, you can find uh, Marvin Dog Media on Twitter. Uh, you can find uh, Facebook pages for all of the Marvin Dog Media shows, Talking Toys with Taylor and Jeff, and uh, the Saturday Morning Supercast are our two shows we have running currently. But uh, I'll announce it here. We are very close to relaunching the pilot episode. Very excited about that. Great. Uh, it, it, it is impending. It'll, it'll be uh, probably within the next... Uh, four to six weeks. We'll uh, have that out again. And that, for the, anyone who doesn't know, that is a 
a discussion of television, uh, television history, really. We take the uh, first episode of a different television series and discuss uh, how it set up the series it was to follow, how things changed, and uh, just how it works as a standalone episode. I had a lot, have a lot of fun with that. We have a new, uh, Corey and I have a new co-host, Regina Davis, on that show that uh, I'm, I'll announce it here. And uh, that'll be coming out in the next, again, four to six weeks. Really excited about that. And uh, you can find all of those on the, just, just look up the name of the show on Facebook and you'll find it. And uh, other than that, uh, I think that's all I had to promote right now. You better wow. get Tail Gold Monkey on that show then. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. I remember that so well. Uh, wow, that's great. And thank you for sharing that major announcement on the show. I can't wait to s- spread the word with everybody else. So guys, thank you again so much for coming back on Coffee with Kenobi. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, thank you for having us. You know, it, we're always happy to come back. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> As we close out the show, I want to thank our CWK sponsors, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel and One Nation Coffee. Please support them the way they support our podcast. And remember to listen to new and archived shows of Coffee with Kenobi wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, CastBox, Deezer, and our website, www.coffeewithkenobi.com or wherever you enjoy listening to your favorite shows. And if you listen to the show through iTunes, please leave us a review. You can also find us on social media. In fact, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook and check us out on Pinterest. In addition to the places I just mentioned for Coffee with Kenobi, you can find me twice a month on the podcast Looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network, as well as on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. You can find my writings on CWK's website, as well as StarWars.com and IGN where I contribute articles on Star Wars as well as other popular culture topics. Don't forget to check out www.patreon.com slash coffee with Kenobi to support our podcast and help us keep the lights on here in the Coffee with Kenobi studios. Our Patreon page is where you can listen to our exclusive weekly podcast CWK Pour Over hosted by me, CWK newsman Tom Gross and Coffee with Kenobi co-founder Corey Club for just $5 a month. There are also options for behind-the-scenes videos, photos, t-shirts, and more. Plus, 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital each month. Thank you to all of you for currently supporting us on Patreon, and thank you for considering becoming a member of our Coffee with Kenobi Patreon family. And if you are considering starting a podcast or blog, let me know how I can help you get started and help you make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out my all-new venture, danzymedia.com, and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization, talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. That's going to do it for show number 321 of Coffee with Kenobi. I want to thank Matt Moore and Jeff McGee for joining me this week to talk about the rise of Skywalker. Where do you sit on the rise of Skywalker? How do you feel about this movie? Has it aged well for you in this month in a few weeks here or there? Or is it something where you're still not even sure just yet and you need to watch it in the comfort of your own home? I can certainly understand that as well. Look, next week we're going to start talking about the Clone Wars. We're not going to forget about the Rise of Skywalker. We've got an entire summer to do that. But we want to get back to the Clone Wars because, of course, that series is coming back, which is wonderful. Maybe we'll do a retrospective next week, get hyped For the new season, let me know what you want to talk about on The Clone Wars. Also, we've got a big thing coming very, very soon. I'm sure you saw on social media and on our Patreon page that we are going to do a Facebook group of Coffee with Kenobi. It's much more active community-wise, and I think it's going to give us more opportunities to talk. I mean, the Facebook page is great. Twitter is great, Instagram is great, but they are not as streamlined as using a Facebook group. We've got some ideas about what we want to call those. Be sure to go to Facebook and check those out. In fact, I will just share with you right now some of the top ones that we have. It seems like the top one really is Cafe Kenobi. We've got some ones for Cafe Obi-Wan, Kenobi Coffee Cantina, Kenobi's Cantina, Club Obi-Wan, all kinds of them. Gwyneth Mullins even offered... Obi-Wan Kenobi, Kenobucks. <laughs> that might be a 
a mouthful, but it looks like Cafe Kenobi is very much in the lead. So go ahead and check that out and see which one you think would sound the coolest. We're also open to other ideas, but we want to have a group where people can interact a lot more freely. I mean, even for me to read to you on our Facebook page, it took me a while to kind of hunt around and to look at the comments, but on the Facebook groups, it's just a lot easier. So I'm going to stop babbling about that because we need to launch this thing. Again, let me know which one you think would be a good name. Let's try to pick a date to launch this thing. I'll tell you what, let me pull up the calendar here. Of course, we've got Valentine's Day this week. Now, how about February 10th will be the launch of our Facebook group? So, yeah, you've got a couple of days to vote. Let me know which one you think would be best. In the meantime, be sure to check out everything Coffee with Kenobi has to offer. As I said earlier, have a wonderful weekend. Stay warm. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.